Hi everyone, I'm back with a new video. Uh, this time I'm going to uh, talk about S3. So basically this is a very long pending video I don't to make, but uh, finally uh, I got some time to make a video on S3. So basically this is uh, uh, one of the storage service available uh, in AWS. Plus. Right, uh, so not only this, we have uh, multiple storage services in AWS. All right, um, so but this S3 actually comes under object-based storage, right? So if uh, you observe, we have uh, object-based storage, we have uh, block-based storage, we have storage over the network, right? Uh, different services in AWS. So first of all, let's try to understand what exactly is object-based storage is. Object-based storage, actually, uh, the storage, uh, it uh, stores all our files as an objects, right? Um, in simple, if you are uploading something into Google Drive, right, or uh, Dropbox or OneDrive, all files are going to store and that every file is going to have some metadata the information about that file. So, you know, uh, that we call it as an object-based. Important thing is we cannot use this object-based storage to uh, install any operating system. We cannot run any program. You just want to store something. You use this object-based storage and you can store all your files. So that's the object-based storage. When coming to block-based storage, it actually uh, involves dividing data into fixed sized blocks, right? So every block, uh, the size is going to be like uh, KBs to MB. If you're taking your uh, laptop hard disk drive, so that is going to be treated as a block based storage. So where you can run some, uh, where you can run operating systems, where you can install programs. So this, whatever the thing you are going to uh, store in this block-based storage, it is going to fill up the blocks. Okay. And um, if you're taking uh, this block-based storage, we can use uh, for our EC2 instances to run our operating system. We can install programs in this block-based storage. And we have some more services in AWS like EFS, FSX. So that is storage over the network. So the storage over the network, the storage device uh, runs in this network and multiple devices can communicate. Okay, so this S3 actually comes under object-based storage. It designed to store flat files. So important thing here is we cannot install or run any applications or operating systems. So I'll take you through this notepad as we are uh, uh, discussing about S3. So right, uh, S3 stands for Simple Storage Service, SSS and AWS named, uh, named it as a S3, right? So go to S3 and in S3, primarily you can find an entity called uh, bucket. But right? you see here, bucket. I already have 13 buckets. I'm using these for different purposes. So bucket is nothing but a folder with unique namespace. Whatever bucket you are creating here, treat it like a folder only or a directory only, but whatever name you are going to give, that should be unique. Why that unique? Why that should be unique? So whatever data you're going to store in this S3 bucket, right? So we can make it public we can access the data with the help of uh, URLs also when you make it public. So to access it over the internet, so obviously we need to like uh, we need to get some uniqueness for our data, right? That uniqueness actually coming with the bucket name. So to create a bucket, here is an option. First, click on create bucket. Then it asks you bucket name. When you are creating this bucket names, we should follow some naming standards. Bucket name should not start with the dot. For example, if you are trying to create a bucket with dot Avinash, it won't allow. Let's scroll down, create bucket. You see it's giving an error. Bucket name should not end with dot. And also, if you want, you can give one dot. For example, if you decided to create a bucket with avi.nash, it is a very valid bucket name. But if you are trying to get avi dot dot nash, so you should not have two continuous dots or two adjacent uh, dots. Okay, so if you have, it won't allow. 
and also there is one more thing minimum this name size should be three characters if you are trying to create a bucket with two letters it won't allow it should be three right so if i am trying to create a z so the bucket is already existed a a a bucket is already existed a a q bucket already existed so minimum three letters maximum 63 characters it supports right um i am calling it as a avinash dot yt dot demo right so there is multiple dots are there but these are not continuous dots so obviously this bucket name is very valid and also this bucket name should be unique as i told you if someone already created a bucket uh, with this name i am not allowed to create and also if you try to change this region and if you try to create a bucket still it won't work basically this s3 bucket names should be unique across the globe so that means i already like you know let's assume someone already have a bucket with this avinash name so can i switch to like a uh, canada region and can i create can i switch to paris and can i create with this name no these names should be unique across the globe so i'm creating um, avinash.yt uh, lab right so i'm going to create this bucket in mumbai region even through platform is global we should choose a region while creating the bucket the reason the actual data stores uh, or exist in this mumbai okay so the remaining options i'm going with default so basically this is to enable acls on our bucket access control list this is to like you know blocking public access for our data we can make the data public bucket versioning we will talk about that and there is no option to disable this encryption so we will talk all these things right so click on create bucket now a bucket created click on view details all right the bucket created now so what we can do with this bucket you can upload anything here whatever you are going to upload it treated as an object we call it as an object and this object right has some limitation size limitations minimum object size 0 byte how small file that is you can upload here the maximum object size it supports is a 5 tb okay that is one individual object again whenever we are creating this bucket it's not asked us to select any um, you know uh, specific size technically this s3 is uh, doesn't require any pre provisioning while you are creating this bucket not asked you to select okay do you need 10 gb 20 gb 30 gb like that right so if it is asking that's provision but here we are not provisioning anything you have unlimited data in this s3 platform we can store unlimited data here but when coming to individual object so the maximum one object you are going to upload here is a 5 tb so let's quickly upload something here click on upload and add files you can even perform drag and drop also add files or you can even add folders i'm doing add files and i'm going to upload uh, a simple file let me try to find something um i have this uh, index.html let me click on open so then scroll down click on open right so the file is actually now uploaded not only this you can upload in any format file even so the, the thing is it won't verify what kind of file you are uploading what file format that contains even if you have .exe files .msi files right so you can upload here everything treated as an object that's a important thing and browsers right browser support some kind of file formats it may not support some kind of file formats if your browser supports for example this is .html obviously browser supports opening this html files when i click on open it's going to show this okay so it's not a s3 feature it's a browser feature for example let me click upload add files i'm going to upload something that is in um, where is that ta 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 draw i o format right so click on upload 
this file is in draw uh, draw io right so if you're trying to go here if you're trying to open see it's not opening it's immediately downloading here so if your browser supports it's open here if your browser don't supports so it treated that as a get object api call and it is going to download to our local laptop all right so now this is like a, uh, creating a bucket and uploading something here let me find some image um, i have any image here task reference talks now okay here i have an image okay so let's take that image click on upload yeah we upload an image here and if you're trying to open yes the browser supports we are able to see that image here so we are opening this image with currently using user i and user we have not made it public and whatever the file you are going to upload to this s3 bucket we are going to get a url for that that is a object url let's go to object and you see here we have this option called object url so these object urls if you copy and if you paste it here right it's saying access denied so basically these urls is a like you know internet accessible urls so whenever you make this object publicly available anyone can access this object by using this url so to make any object public we first need to disable some settings so we can make an object public by using two options one is by using acl second one by using bucket policy let's concentrate on acl option now so i decided to share this object for everyone with this url and also this is not a fixed url guys this is not a fixed url we even have some concepts like a virtual paths also if you have dot in the bucket name so obviously you have to go with the standard url the standard url is https colon slash slash s3 service name then region in what region this bucket created and amazon aws dot com is a common url then bucket name slash object name right so if you don't have dot in the bucket name let's take uh, a bucket where uh, i have a i i owned a bucket with the name called avinash so if you observe any file here let's take demo.txt you see this this url is something different https colon slash slash my bucket name that is avinash dot s3 dot amazon aws dot com my object name so technically we call this as a virtual path these virtual paths actually works whenever we don't have any dot in the bucket name so you follow the standard uh, url so that works whether we have dot in the bucket name or we don't have dot in the bucket name all right so now uh, my requirement i want to make this uh, object public that's our first requirement for that first go to permissions now observe this permissions overview access bucket and objects not public so go here block public access is there you need to edit but before that as i told you i'm going to use acl method you see currently acl is not enable its bucket owner enforced go to object ownership click on edit acl is disabled by defaultly enable acl i acknowledge that object owner preferred save changes now we have enabled acl so when you go to object select the object go to actions scroll down to last option make public using acl if you don't enable that option this will be in uh, uh, grayed out so click on make public using acl scroll down click on make public but you see here it's failing so the reason is whenever you select this option and making it public observe when public read access is enabled and not blocked by block public access setting anyone in the world can access specified object that's absolutely fine but you see this here public access is blocked because block public access setting is turned on so you need to go to permissions this block all public access should be turned off if you want to make any object public from this bucket so type confirm 
click on confirm. All right. So now we are allowing this S3 bucket settings to make an object public. Again, you see object can be public. It's not declared all objects are public. If you go here, give a refresh. Is it working? No, it's not working. Right. We disable block all public access. We enable ACLs. But still, whatever data you want to make public, you explicitly edit that bucket ACLs to make it public. Click on make public. Now this object is public. If you don't want to do all these things, you can simply create a bucket policy. You can apply that bucket policy, then all the data we have in that bucket is going to work. Now, okay, let's just this go here, give a refresh. You see here, this URL works not only in my local network or not only in my laptop, it works across the globe. So let me take an incognito window and I'm giving that URL, you see, that is working. So this is how exactly we can create a bucket, we can upload data to this S3 bucket and we can make it as a public by using ACL. Right, so if you observe, whenever we upload any data to S3 platform, we are getting this storage class option. So it's important to understand the storage classes. If you are taking another services like a Google Drive or a Dropbox or OneDrive, we don't have this storage class option. If you are going with Google Drive, so you obviously need to choose, you want to go with 100 GB plan, 200 GB plan and all, right? So, but here, no pre-provisioning. And also, if you purchase 100 GB plan, you are just storing 10 GB data inside it, but still you will get charged for 100 GB. Okay, so that's a provision method. But here in S3, we have a concept called storage classes. We have multiple storage classes actually based on our access pattern. In simple, access pattern means what is your like, you know, data access requirements, how frequently you're going to access the file. Whenever you got any requirement, how quickly you need that file. Based on these two things, we can decide what storage class we really required for our data. For example, these three objects are there. Out of these three objects, I'm going to access this file every day, n number of times, like let's assume thousand times I'm going to access this. This one, weekly once or twice I'm going to access. This one, I'm not at all going to access just for some, like, you know, backup purpose or I just want to hold that file. For that purpose, I upload it here. Not going to access it all. So, if you upload all three into same bucket, right, so, uh, costing us with same price is unfair, right? So what AWS did based on our access pattern, as I'm accessing this n number of the times per day, I can choose one storage class. This one periodically I'm accessing, but I need it immediately. When I, when I need it, I need it immediately. So I'm going to choose a different storage class and different storage class. So based on our access pattern, we can decide the storage classes. Let's, uh, Observe what are the storage classes we have and how to change that. We even have an option to automate the storage classes also. Let's select the object, scroll down. You see here we have an option called storage class. Currently we have standard. So this S3 standard is designed to store frequently accessed data. Okay. Whatever files you're accessing on daily basis, n number of the times, right? You can go and choose this standard storage class. Click on edit. You can see what exactly this is designed for. S3 standard is designed to store frequently accessed data with milliseconds access. Okay, so the use case is more than once a month you want to use. Then you go with the standard. In backend, whatever file we are going to upload to S3, AWS is going to maintain multiple copies in backend. Right, you see here, availability zones, this value means, you know, availability zone is nothing but a data center or a combination of data centers. So this file, whatever file we uploaded, right? So that file, like, you know, AWS actually maintaining three copies in backend. It maintaining 
three copies in backend that is what it is mentioning here so why three copies generally this s3 has some values like availability and durability s3 platform has an availability of 99.99 percentage durability is 99.99999999999 percentage durability so chances to lost data is 0 0.0000001 percentage right to give that availability and durability aws is going to maintain multiple copies in backend so that is a standard the use case is if you are going to access a file more than once in a month you go and choose this standard that's appropriate storage class okay and i have some file that hardly i'm going to access only once in a month okay once in a month but when i need i want to access that file immediately then we can choose this standard infrequently access infrequently access data once a month with millisecond access we can go with standard infrequently access right so then we have one more ones or infrequently access so basically these two designed for same purpose there only one difference is one zone that that data like you know stores only in one availability zone not three okay aws don't maintain three copies it maintain only one copy if you select this one zone infrequently access right so if you observe this infrequently access and standard data available immediately whenever you want you can simply go and open that file and you can access it so that's a like you know uh, advantage with this uh, standard and standard infrequently access or one zone infrequently access now if you observe there is another storage class called glacier these three comes under glacier storage classes earlier we have only one but later amazon like you know made it as a three so earlier we have only this glacier flexible retriever you see formerly glacier whatever data you are storing in glacier you cannot access it immediately that's the first thing data will be available but you cannot simply go and open that file if it is in glacier <laughs> okay so now glacier instant retrieval quarterly once you can access this file immediately but not multiple times if that is what your requirement then go and choose this glacier instant retrieval once a quarter instant retrieval is possible immediately you can open that okay the second one is flexible retrieval long lived archive data accessed once a year with retrieval of minutes to hours you can access n number of the times okay so but you know you need to wait for some time you need to initialize the restoration okay so when you initialize the data restoration it will ask you we have multiple options okay it's standard retrieval expedited retrieval bulk retrieval <coughs> excuse me so we have multiple options so based on the option you select the data will be restored for this glacier flexible retrieval when coming to glacier deep archive so it's for long lived and the restoration generally takes hours not uh, minutes to hours <laughs> so then we have glacier uh, sorry glacier deep archive it's going to take uh, hours and we have rrs reduced redundancy storage first of all it's not recommended it's not recommended as s3 standard is more cost effective and also there is a problem with this rrs disadvantage the platform durability is 9.99 percentage uh, only so chances to lost data is high if you are using rrs <laughs> okay so then scroll down i am going to choose standard infrequently access now then click on save changes so earlier when data is in uh, s3 standard we are able to open it immediately now it is in standard infrequently access let me try to open this and i am able to open it immediately right so we are able to access file immediately even through if it is in infrequently access now scroll down let me change the storage class to one zone infrequently access save changes now 
this object storage class is one zone infrequently access still i can access it immediately right so standard standard infrequently access one zone infrequently access we can get data immediately but when coming to glacier it's not like that go to storage class edit i'm going to select glacier flexible retrieval scroll down save changes now this object is in glacier and immediately we got this little warning this object stored in glacier so in order to access it you first restore it and if you go to this object and if you click on this open is it highlighted now if you want you can delay it right but you cannot go and you cannot open this file and also is this public url works we made it public and if you wait for some time and if you refresh this also won't work right so the browser cache may taking effect in this scenario but generally it won't work right so now if you try to open this it's not working then how to open this so as we discussed we first need to initialize the restoration initiate restore click on initiate restore so the restoration right so how many days you want to access it immediately for coming day two days i want to access it for coming three days or coming uh, uh, 365 days i want to access it immediately so you can define i'm going to give coming two days i want to access it immediately the restored copy will be available till this 23rd okay so i'm going with the uh, expert retrieval it's going to be bit quick within 1 to 5 minutes i can show the output but uh, there is a limitation if you want to use this expedited retrieval your uh, object size should be less than 250 mb so yeah that's okay our object size is less than 250 it's just a simple image right if you are going with standard 3 to 5 hours bulk it's going to be take 5 to 12 hours go with expedited retrieval scroll down click on initiate restoration now this object restoration is initiated the restoration is in progress and once this restoration is completed we can go and open this file n number of the times but for how many days till that the restoration expires okay so that means for two days from now right so these are the storage classes we have here in AWS uh, S3 platform, and it's also important for your certification exam if you are planning to attend any. And also, um, these are the points. Meanwhile, we have uh, two to three minutes, right? So meanwhile, we'll go through this. And in AWS, we have a default uh, soft limit for number of buckets we can create in this account. That's a hundred. But this is soft limit. You can raise a ticket with AWS, and you can create uh, more than hundred buckets also. and also um, block public access the free tier limitation s3 actually comes under free tier so we are going to get 5 gb standard storage under free tier limitation and also you can get a 2000 put operation and 20000 get operations under free tier limitation put means treated as a upload get means treated as a opening the file or downloading the file how many times you are accessing the object is also called as a get operation so under free tier limitation 2000 put operation 20000 get operation and storage classes and its properties mentioned here so basically s3 pricing involved on three things one is how much data you are storing second one is how many operations you are performing put operation get operation post operation update operation how many operations you are performing and how many how how much data retrieval is happening see if you observe the pricing so the standard infrequently access price is, is going to be less compared to s3 standard and you might uh, get it out like you know we humans intelligently what we will do we will uh, apply the standard infrequently access for regularly accessible data also why because both uh, in both the scenario data will be available immediately right so but the problem is so you can store same files in standard and standard infrequently access 
if you are accessing n number of the times even though data is in infrequently access this data retrieval charges applicable and cost is going to be same as that uh, as the standard so obviously based on the use case only you choose so these three are the primary factors in s3 pricing and these are the glacier data retrieval options by this time data retrieval should be complete let's go to this file and data restoration status is now completed we can go and open this file and we can access all right so that is how exactly you can change storage class and object and um, you can like uh, uh, restore an object if it is in glacier all right yeah, that's it for uh, this uh, video guys so i'm going to continue this s3 series so please spare some time and uh, subscribe to this uh, youtube channel for more videos on aws services Thank you guys. All right, uh, let's talk about uh, this S3 bucket uh, properties. So one of the uh, important property in this S3 is bucket versioning. So basically this bucket versioning, I hope you might aware about uh, the regular versioning tools. So this is also works in similar manner, but uh, S3 is an object based, right? Uh, so flat files, right? So here, instead of uh, data level uh, it take uh, the uploaded time as a stamp here all right so let's take uh, a small scenario where you have a file you are modifying that file multiple times per day and uh, you are uploading it to s3 platform right so somehow you did some wrong edit and you uploaded it or accidentally you have deleted that file okay so in that scenario you can use this versioning feature to get it to correct state or if you accidentally delete we can uh, get that object back if versioning is not enabled just observe one thing we don't have any version feature now and also if you go to properties bucket versioning is disabled so i'll do this operation now when versioning is in disabled state and i also do the same thing by enabling versioning. So let me click on upload. Before that, let me create a simple text file. Right. So I'm going to call this as a version doc. I'm going to save it on my desktop, YouTube. I'll call this as version.txt. All right, this is my file. I'm going to upload this version.txt to my s3 platform right let's do drag and drop uh, yeah i uploaded now the version.txt also i did some like uh, updated i i updated this doc so i'm going to save this upload add files my desktop I have this version.txt now and upload. So not only to, if you want, like, you know, you can delete and you can, or you can, uh, let's call this as a update three, control yes, and going to upload, add files. This is the problem with this tool I'm using. Version.txt is here, upload right i did multiple edits to the same file and i uploaded multiple times if i go to this object if i go to version tab i don't have any versions so all i have is only most recently uploaded one okay so why the versioning is not enabled so i cannot track what modification happened on this file earlier okay that's first thing second thing we deleted this accidentally okay so if you want to delete an object you need to type permanently delete then click on delete object this object deleted successfully and now you immediately realized you deleted a wrong file and you want to get that file back again to your s3 bucket 
So if you go here, there is no undo option and control Z won't work. We don't have any recycle bin kind of things. So we cannot get it back as versioning is not enabled. Let's do same activity by enable versioning. Navigate to properties, edit bucket version, enable. Once you enable, there is no option for disable, only you can suspend. Save changes. Now, go to object. Let me edit this. Edit one is the first edit I'm going here. Upload, add files. version.txt then upload upload it successfully let's do some additional modification edited i'm calling it as a two right let's do drop and drop upload it's uploaded also, you can remove something or you can add something. Test edit three with versioning. I have saved this information to the file and I'm doing this drag and drop again. Upload files, upload file uploaded three times. Now you see here as we enable versioning, we got this option called show versions. What are the files you already have? before enabling this version that also will get a version id as a null okay after enabling versioning whatever the file you upload that will get a version id this is going to be unique and we cannot manage we cannot edit we cannot customize this and you see this this is what most recently uploaded one these are the previous ones and not only from the screen you select that individual object go to versions option you see the current version, current version or latest version is nothing but the most recently uploaded one. These are the two previous ones. So you want to verify if you if you click on open this option, it shows only latest one. But I decided to go with the previous versions. I can select that individual one, click on open. This is edit one. This is edit two we performed. And this is most recent uh, or latest version or current version we good so you are able to track all the edits even if you don't modify anything you re-upload the file again still you will get a new version why because s3 is a flat file structure so it it won't read whether any data level modifications happen or not when you have uploaded file only that is matter now what happened uh, accidentally you have deleted this file or sometimes what happened you might write some wrong data added some wrong data here in this stage right and after adding we have uploaded this file to s3 also now it's uploaded successfully whenever you are trying to open this file it's showing the wrong data one. So wrong data one is treated as a current version object now. So if you want to take this, if you go to versions, this is a current version, right? But it is, it is with wrong data. You want to remove this only individual version and you want to make this as a current version. So in that scenario, if you directly select this current version, you have this delete option or you go to this bucket enable this show versions currently the 1719 is the latest version so you select that only that individual version and delete this 1717 will become latest version so by setting this versioning to show you can delete the wrong one even through if it is the most recent one otherwise go to this versions select this delete now whenever you are trying to delete by navigating to that version screen it's asking you to type permanently delete delete it's permanently delete and observe 1717.1 will become current version okay so whenever you are deleting current version the next available one will promote it as a current version here
that is also one option now what happened some guy like you know selected this file and he deleted this he deleted this object and just observe one thing we are typing just delete right click on delete object now what happened object deleted that file is not available in s3 platform now if you want to get that file back right so you can just set this version into show you see this existing three versions overridden with a delete marker delete marker size is going to be zero byte it won't cost us anything so you select the delete marker delete the delete marker you will get this object back just observe this again when i set version to hide there is no version.txt file but when i set version to show this version.txt got a delete marker you select the delete marker and delete the delete marker and you can type permanently delete when deleting the delete marker and then immediately you will get your object back you see now we got this version.txt file so in some cases you decided to delete this object permanently including all the previous versions and all expand the show versions select all this delete as versioning is enabled or you can automate this by using lifecycle uh, rule that we will talk in some time all right so this is a versioning feature and also one point to note on this versioning aws won't cost us only for this latest one or current one if you expand the show versions you see this aws is going to cost us 8 plus 20 plus 52 so these all individual versions right so aws is going to cost for all these individual versions also so it's important to like you know keep only some versions and or important to implement a automatic deletion in this s3 bucket right so that we can do with the help of life cycle management rule all right um that's about versioning and uh, you can go and edit if you really want you can suspend existing object do not change but newly uploading object won't get any version ids all right that's it uh, for this versioning concept so let's discuss another option we have here in this s3 that is uh, replication we have a option called uh, cross region replication or same region replication right so this replication help us to maintain multiple copies of our data in different geographical location like you now for example this bucket we created uh, here in mumbai region so i'm worrying about this mumbai region uh, uh, platform availability so if i completely depend on only mumbai region for my data okay so if something happened so i cannot uh, uh, I, I cannot access the data right when mumbai uh, platform is down s3 platform is down for some time i cannot access all the data so to be in safe side for backup purpose whatever data i have here i'm going to replicate this all data to another region uh, s3 bucket if your another bucket is in same region we call it as a same region replication but if your bucket is in another region we call it as a cross region replication i will configure cross region replication but note one point here data transfer fees applicable whenever you are performing cross region replication if it is same region replication data transfer cost won't applicable okay so now this bucket is in mumbai region i want to configure a backup bucket in another region let's go to s3 bucket s3 platform i'm going to create a bucket now i'm going to call that bucket as dot bkp same name i have given again you no need to maintain same naming standard you can give your own name all right so i'm going to give dot bkp and AWS region as I'm going to give Singapore region. 
right now let's scroll down and create bucket right bucket successfully created now my requirement is whatever the data we upload to this mumbai region bucket that should replicate to the singapore region bucket automatically without any manual operations okay so for that we can go to management we have replication rule click on create replication rule and you see here if you want to use this replication rule feature versioning must be enabled on source bucket as well as destination bucket here just observe bucket versioning is in disable mode if you try to use this bucket aws enforce us to enable this versioning then only we can use this feature all right replication rule mumbai to singapore replication do you want to keep it in enable state or disable later also you can enable i'm going to enable it what is your source bucket this is what my source bucket what are all the data you want to upload apply to all objects in this bucket whatever data we are going to upload here to source bucket those all replicate if you want to limit this to a prefix or a folder for example in this bucket you have only one specific folder click on create folder technically we call it as a prefix and i'm calling it as a test create folder now instead of all data replication from this bucket i want to replicate uh, data only from this test folder only so then simply i can give here as a prefix as a test slash you no need to give slash here and no need to add the bucket name also you just give the prefix now within this folder whatever the data we have only that data will replicate to target bucket so let's go with apply to all objects in this bucket and where is your destination bucket one thing the destination bucket may be in same account or it may be in different account also we can configure whenever you replicating it to different aws account you just need to create a, a bucket policy and you need to apply that bucket policy at the target bucket also that i'll demonstrate in another video right i'm going to specify bucket in this account only then click on browse s3 what is a bucket you just go and i'm going to uh, select the bucket we created for backup purpose that is in singapore region choose path and immediately you see i told you one thing source and uh, target versioning must be bucket versioning must be enabled so click on enable bucket versioning so now versioning is enabled scroll down and obviously you need an iam role to perform this activity to replicate data from source to target you obviously need an iam role so for that right go here select the first option create new role so whatever data you are replicating from source bucket to target bucket you can enable replicate you can enable with uh, you can enable replication with encryption with the help of kms so for that you can enable and you can choose what key you want to so that i am not uh, interested much on this now we will talk about that and replicated data we can change the storage class only replicated data i want to get one zone in frequently access whatever data replicate from this bucket to this backup bucket so only the data will get this selected storage class if we manually upload something directly to this backup bucket <laughs> okay so it is going to choose s3 standard as a storage class all right so just for test purpose i am using one zone in frequently access and replication time control if you enable this option 99.99% of data will replicate within 15 minutes but additional charges apply when you enable this option metrics also will come automatically and delete marker replication so delete marker 
like you know whenever you delete something delete markers will create right so those delete marker operations also will replicate to the target bucket but remember one thing if you are using life cycle role it won't replicate right just click on save and replica modification sync is like a metadata modification synchronization so click on save i am not adding any of these features then click on save now you might get a doubt fine all the future uploads are going to replicate but what about the existing data we already have some files and folders here right is the data replicates automatically no if you have lot of data as a one time activity you can use aws batch operations for that yes replicate existing data submit but i am not really interested about existing data and also don't use this option it is going to cost you i'm going to select no do not replicate existing objects i'll tell you one simple command to do that so simply use a sync command give a command like a aws space you give aws space s3 space sync source bucket space destination bucket as a one time activity okay then later all remaining automatically aws will do okay so now again that sync operation required aws cli configuration don't worry about that at moment right now let me upload something to the source bucket and let's observe whether it is replicating to target bucket or not click on upload add files i have some logo images here i'm uploading two images now <laughs> upload all right i uploaded two files this logo.png and this jpg if you scroll down if you observe replication status is pending once this replication status showing as a completed you will get that file here just currently just observe no object here i'll just refresh you see both the files now replicated so even to double check we enable one zone infrequently access uh, for replicated data right you can see the replicated data contains storage class as a one zone infrequently access right so that means whatever data you are uploading here in this bucket that is replicating to the singapore region bucket and also you might get some doubts like you know can i make this as a source bucket and this as a target bucket you can but important thing is whatever the data actually replicated right you will get replication status as a replica this file won't replicate back to the source bucket if you directly upload something here yes that will replicate if you make this as a source and this as a target and also can i configure this source to multiple targets for example this bucket is in singapore and from this source i want to replicate it to different region like a paris region of course we can do it okay so that is uh, all about replication we have in this s3 so we will talk about life cycle management role in continuation so yeah now uh, we are going to talk about uh, s3 life cycle management roles so in our like you know uh, earlier um, s3 video we discussed uh, about uh, s3 storage classes different storage classes its advantages right so you have some data in your s3 bucket uh, in s3 standard and you have a specific access pattern like uh, for first uh, one month or two months you are going to access uh, n number of the times per day and later for a couple of months you are going to access less frequently like um, quarterly once or monthly once or weekly just once you are going to access some data and then after for a compliance reasons and all you want to have the data you don't want to delete it right so you want to have it for at least 2 years after 2 years then you want to delete the data 
So doing this transition manually is obviously a, a, a hectic task, right? So you need to go there and you need to observe when this object is created, you need to set a reminder, right? If you want to do it, uh, the manual transitions. So instead of the manual transitions, whatever the storage classes we have in AWS, from S3 standard, as you are aware, whenever you upload any object to S3 bucket, defaultly it picks S3 standard as a storage class. From S3 standard, we can transit to different storage classes. So uh, here is a diagram from AWS, right, a documentation. So if you observe, these all are the different storage classes we have. S3 standard, the default storage class, we have infrequently access, intelligent tiring, one zone infrequently access, Glacier, these three comes under Glacier categories. So one, when you upload something to S3 standard, so from S3 standard, you can move that object to any of these storage classes. See, these all are the pos possible ones. From S3 standard, you can move it to infrequently access, or you can move it to intelligent tiring, or you can move it to one zone infrequently access. So it supports all this. And reverse transitioning is not possible. So that means you move from S3 standard to like, you know, one zone infrequently access. So by using this lifecycle management role, can we get it back again from infrequently access to standard? No, it's not possible. So if you observe this one zone infrequently access, from one zone infrequently access, we can move it to Glacier flexible retrieval, not to instant retrieval. Why? Because that's not possible, the transition. So, or you can move it to Glacier deep archive. So you can refer this, I'll share this URL in our video description. So you can refer that and you can understand the possible transitions. And this is a very simple or high level one I'm using to explain this feature. Now I have an S3 bucket inside that S3 bucket. I have some data. Whatever the data I upload to this S3 bucket, it defaultly comes to S3 standard. From S3 standard, I want to move it to infrequently access or one zone infrequently access. Okay, so for that, there is a small limitation that your object must be in S3 standard for at least 30 days. So you upload something to S3 standard. Immediate next day, you cannot move it to infrequently access. Yes, that is a limitation we have here. So object must store at least for 30 days in S3 standard. Then only you can move it to infrequently access. Then you need to wait again 30 days or total 60 days from object creation date. You see here. So the benchmark we are taking uh, for, for mentioning this value, the benchmark I'm taking as an object creation date. 60 days from object creation, you can move it to Glacier. You can immediately, in next day, you can delete it. Again, these are minimum days. If you want to move uh, or if you want to delete after um, one year or two years or three years, yes, you can define. But these are the minimum values. And that too, if you want to follow this specific transition. Again, sometimes you, like, you know, your organizational requirement may be different. You may not to move your object to infrequently access. Right. So whatever data you have in standard, you decided to directly move it to Glacier. Right. So Glacier Deep Archive, then you can choose this another transition. Whatever data you have in standard, you can move it to Glacier. Then you can trigger to delete. In this scenario, minimum one day, then on second day two, you can trigger to delete it. Or directly you have some data in S3 standard. And after one day, you decided to delete this. Yes, you can go and delete that immediate next day on same day we cannot delete. Okay, so technically two types of transitions here. One is changing storage class is one transition. Expiring the object is another transition. We are going to configure with the help of lifecycle management rule. So let's go to this uh, S3 bucket we are working on and navigating to management. Uh, this replication role, let me delete. I no longer have that. Right. So here you can see lifecycle rule option. Click on create lifecycle rule. And here you can give a name. And uh, I'm going to call this as a my LCR. 
Now, you want to choose uh, what data need to part of this life cycle role. You want to apply any, you want to apply this transit into a specific folder. You can give folder one, right? Whatever data you have inside this specific folder, only that data will be part of this transition. If you want to apply to entire objects, you simply select apply to all objects in this bucket and I acknowledge. Not only this prefix mechanism, we can apply this lifecycle transitions based on the object tags. In this bucket, whatever the object contain where key is equal to task and value is equal to LCR, only that specific data need to be transitions we configured here. Okay, so then we can get that. Right, or else you can define with the help of uh, object size also. Specify minimum object size, maximum object size, right? Only for example, you specify minimum object size as a 10 MB. So minimum 10 MB files only will be part of this transition. So to make it simple, I'm going to apply to all objects in this S3 bucket and I'm going to acknowledge this. All right. So now life cycle rule options. What exactly you want to configure? As I told you, we have two options. One is trans life storage class transition. Second one is object expiration. First two options related to storage class transitions. Remaining two options is for expiring that object. The third one is for like, you know, incomplete multi-part uploads. So I made a di different video on that. It's already available in my YouTube channel. If you want to perform multi-part upload, please refer that video. So I'm going to select move current version of objects between storage classes. And here, defaultly it's an S3 standard. From S3 standard to where you want to move. To infrequently access, to intelligent tiring, one zone infrequently access, you select the supported ones. So S3 standard, I want to move it to standard infrequently access. Again, if you are trying to give 10 days and all, so then when you are creating a rule, it will give an error. So minimum value should be 30 days. So from infrequently access, I want to move it to Glacier. Glacier flexible retrieval. So this should be 60 days, 30 days from infrequently access or 60 days from object creation. So you give 60. Right, I'm giving all minimum values here. If you want to give 600 days, of course you can give it. Okay, so now this is for current version of the object. If we upload something today, on day 30, it is going to move to infrequently access. Day 60, it's going to move to glacier. When it is going to expire, that we can configure by selecting a third option. Third option is related to current version of objects. And here you can define, okay, I want to keep this file for 90 days and I want to delete it. From day 60 onwards, it will be on Glacier. On day 90, it is going to expire. So this is a current version of object. So obviously, we are going to get a delete marker. Delete marker overrides our object. So that happens on day 90. Now, how about non-current versions? So you need to select the second and fourth option move non-current version of objects then configure the transition so you no need to follow same transitions for current version as well as non-current version objects for example you don't want to do any transition for non-current version object directly from s3 standard you want to trigger to delete this so then you no need to add this you can simply remove or you no need to check this option directly you can select permanently delete now I want to, once an object become non-current, I want to keep that object for seven days and I want to delete that. And we even have an option, right, uh, to retain new versions. For example, I don't want to delete most recently uh, uh, created non-current versions. Apart from those two, it will wait for the date, then it is going to delete. Okay. So we can configure that and create rule. Before applying this lifecycle rule, object don't contain any expiration values. If you go to this object, if you scroll down, you see here 
earlier this is going to be empty but now you observe this we got an expiration rule my lcr that is like you know on september 20 so as per this um, life cycle management rule this object is going to expire after uh, the 90 days or 90 days yeah i think we configured 90 days only to expire that object all right so yeah so that is all about uh, life cycle management role it help us to do automatic transition from one storage class to another storage class and automatically uh, help us to delete the object right so that is all about life cycle management role and uh, in we are going to discuss some more uh, s3 properties in continuation thank you guys all right uh, let's discuss uh, another s3 uh, property right so whenever you go to s3 bucket property so you already know versioning this right so let's discuss about this event notification feature we have on our s3 bucket so you know, this events like you know when something happen on our s3 bucket we can get uh, notifications for these notifications actually we can use a service called sms to get notification to our given email ids so generally whenever any operation happen like a put operation or a get operation post operation delete operation so that means if any object is uploaded to s3 bucket downloaded from s3 bucket or uh, updated with latest content right so or deleted we can get notifications so not only for that uh, we whenever any object uh, uh, like storage class is changed we can get notification so such type of all notifications we can configure with the help of this uh, event notifications option also this event notification not only limited to sns right we can uh, uh, tweak or invoke a lambda function or we can invoke a sqs queue also for example when something uploaded to this s3 bucket right i i want to trigger a lambda function that lambda function need to run and it need to pick that file and it need to place in some database or it need to make that file available to some other programs and all so if you want to configure such type of things you can configure target as a lambda okay so let's um, first click on create event notification and you give a name so i want to get alert when an object is uh, deleted deleted alert is a event name i'm giving so i want to uh, apply for entire uh, s3 bucket instead of a specific prefix or suffix if you want to make this uh, events applicable for like you know you want to make it available applicable for only dot pdf format once you can define that also here now what is the event types you want to configure all event all object creation related ones like a put post copy or multipart upload completed or object removal object restored when you uh, restoring something from glacier right you can select this option or acls added acls removed permissions added or replication completed or um, so the object went to intelligent tiring uh, uh, related activities right you can choose based on your requirement i'm going to get an alert whenever any object deleted object removal so that's why i'm calling this event name as a deleted alert right so even or manually also you can select these two you can select simply this option here right so then scroll down i to as i told you the destination we can configure three things one is lambda function if you already have any lambda function you can go and select that here or you can tweak, uh, tweak an uh, sqs queue or you can go with an sns topic also i already have some sns topic but i'll show you how to do this from um, uh, let, let, let first go to sns navigate to topics you first create a topic right click on create topic so sns basically supports uh, two types of topics one is fifo first in first out but it supports only sql service if you are looking for like you know um, email or sms and all you can use this standard uh, sns topic you just give a name um, s3 delete 
alert is a name I'm giving. And what is the display name in your mailbox? I'm going to call this as the S3 YT delete is a display name I'm giving. So now scroll down and create, but there is a problem, right? So basically this S3 trying to use this SNS topic to send a test notification. But by defaultly this uh, SNS don't allow S3 to send any message. So like, you know, what you can do, you can go to access policies. You can allow who can publish. You can go here. Everyone can publish or you can define only specific AWS account and you can give the account IDs here. So to make it uh, simple, I'm going to select everyone. If you don't do this, if you don't do this, right, you're going to get an error. Okay, let's scroll down, create topic and SNS topic created. And now we want to add subscribers. Click on create subscription and the subscription protocol, I'm going to use email. So whatever the email you want to receive the alerts, you give that email here. And again, you cannot simply give someone's email ID. Okay, so whatever email ID you are defining here, you need to log in and you need to confirm the subscription. Then only uh, you will get alerts. Now subscription created, but it is in pending confirmation state only. I'm logging to my email and uh, you say this AWS notification. So we need to confirm the subscription, subscription confirmed. So then we are going to get notifications now. All right, so yeah, let's go here give a refresh you can see the subscription status is confirmed now let's go to s3 platform choose a bucket where you want to configure these uh, events go to property scroll down event notification create event notification give the event name um, delete alerts i want to configure all object removal related even through uh, it is a latest version that creates a delayed marker or previous version permanently deleted we should get notification then scroll down and select sns topic here and choose the sns topic you created and make sure you verify your bucket and sns topic both are in same regions otherwise uh, it may not display here so S3 delete alert is the one we configured then click on save changes and now successfully created. All right. So now let's go to this uh, inbox. You see, we got a test email. Amazon S3. So it is a test event. So the test email is success from this bucket avinas.yt.lab. All right. So now whenever any delayed operation happened on this S3 bucket, immediately we are going to get a notification to this uh, S3. All right, so first let's test this. I'm going to select this index.html and I'm going to delete. So it's as versioning is enabled, right? When I delete this, delete marker is going to create. So let's click on delete object. It's deleted successfully. But uh, you know, the versioning is created. So delete marker created. For that also, we will get a notification. You can see that here. Go here. This is the alert. So basically, this is in JSON format. What you can do, use um, this pretty fine JSON, one of the website. Right in left pane, you give your notification, then click on make pretty. So you see here, in this region, the event happened, object removed, delete marker created from this uh, public IP address it happened and uh, we got alert with the help of an SNS topic of, uh, with the help of an event configured on this S3 bucket called avinas.yt and this is a delete alert, what object deleted, what is the e tag, what is the version ID of that object, everything we are going to get it here. All right, so that's a uh, uh, events configuration also with the help of um, event bridge so uh, i'll definitely make a video on event bridge so basically this event bridge supports two types of uh, things one is event driven process and second one is scheduled process
event driven process means when something happened on a resource then i want to do something else when an object deleted i want to send a notification when object is deleted i want to uh, stop an ec2 instance when object is deleted i want to trigger a lambda function so such type of things we can configure so this events actually supports only three but this event bridge support a lot of things so if you want to send what exactly happening here right if you want to send all that notification to event bridge you have to turn this on all you need to do is click on edit on save changes now this bucket notification will read by event bridge service so that is a s3 events option we have and also if you observe there is a small topic uh, uh, on tag so basically this tags right it's a combination of key and value pairs we can use these tags to filter resources based on like you know tags for example you have 100 s3 buckets out of that 100 s3 buckets like around 20 buckets you are using for one specific project or one specific client so it's difficult to like you know manually going and filtering but for whatever the resource you are creating for the client if you are giving a tag we can easily filter it also help us in pricing uh, understanding how much we are spending for the client and all so for example i'm giving a tag called client so i'm giving a, a client so for all the a, a client i need to associate this tag so then easily I can like, you know, understand this or we even have like a resource groups, tag editors with the help of the tag editor, we can filter the resources. What are all the resources contain this specific tag? Those all resources we can filter, right? So tags is very simple option, but we can use it in very effective manner. All right. So that is uh, about uh, events configuration and tagging on our S3 bucket. Okay, now uh, let's discuss about uh, another S3 property called uh, static website hosting. Okay, so in this uh, S3 static website hosting, uh, we can use this S3 bucket to host our uh, static websites. So basically, uh, static website means it's going to be fixed pages, like uh, it's not the content uh, is not going to be changed uh, from user to user. If you're taking uh, like uh, your university website, that's going to be a dynamic web page where when you are logging, it is going to show your credits, so your assignments. If some other guy logs in, it's going to show his credits, his assignments, and also in backend, we're going to have a database, right? So we're going to have a login page. So whatever credentials you are going to give, it is going to validate against the backend database. Then only it allow use uh, allow you to into the website. So then it displays your content. For another guy, it displays another content. So technically, that we call it as a dynamic website. But with the help of this S3, we can host a static website. The website is going to be fixed. It's going to be a standard website, right? So for that, first you need to create a bucket you need to have a web content. So then you need to upload that content to your S3 bucket. In future, if you have any thoughts to uh, map any domain names to your S3 bucket, you need to take care about one thing that your bucket name and your domain name should be same. For example, I purchased a domain name called learnaws.co.in. If I want to use this domain name to host a static website in AWS, right, I need to create a bucket with the same name. Then only I can map my purchase domain name to this uh, S3 hosted static website. All right. So now you can go and uh, create a bucket. And uh, I'm going to take a text uh, test bucket. I'm going to call this as a uh, Avinash okay AWS with Avinash.com let's assume I'm going to purchase this uh, domain later and I'm going to create this in Mumbai region and ACL you can go with the disable public access so as I told you 
So if you decided to use this S3 bucket to host a static website, we must uh, enable public access. Why? Because a website can be accessible by everyone. So if you are restricting that access, your website won't work. We are going to get uh, 400 related HTTP status codes like uh, access denied, permissions, uh, error to end customer. Right, so I'm going to turning off that and versioning not enabling. I'm going with the default encryption mechanism. So then scroll down, create bucket. All right, a bucket created now. AWS with Avinash.com. And now, uh, like, you know, if you decided to enable static website, you first need to upload the content here. So then go to property. I, I, I don't have any content now. Scroll down to bottom and uh, static website hosting. Click on edit and defaultly it will be in disabled state. Click on enable. Then it will ask you, you want to host a static website or you can redirect any request coming to this bucket to a different host name or a different domain name. So you can give that here. Which protocol you want to use, HTTP or HTTPS, you can define that. I'm going to host a static website. And if you observe, defaultly it is going to ask you for indexed uh, document. Defaultly, 90% of the times it's going to be index.html and an error document. So if you want to deliver any generic error when your website is under maintenance and all, you can even configure this error document also. And uh, it's purely optional one, but this index document is mandatory one. So now, uh, you know, you can get these HTML templates from a lot of websites. So uh, free CSS uh, templates, so this is a website, free-css.com. You can go to this website and you can download any of the templates. You go here and they're giving some uh, free templates. You just need to download this and you upload all this content to your S3 bucket. So that option you can use. Another option, you can create your own. So I create very basic and very simple one. I'm going to open a HTML tag. I'm going to give a header and I'm going to call this as this website is hosted using S3 static website feature. And I'm going to closing the header. All right. If you want to give any header to demo by Avinash Ready. I'm going to make it as a header too. So then I'm closing that HTML tag. Control S. So I'm going to save this to our uh, YouTube folder itself. And I'm going to call this as a index.html. All right. So if you want, you can verify. You go here, just verify. Here is an index.html. You open it. This is what uh, that web page is. All right, so now let's create uh, another one for error.html. I'm going to take this, uh, removing header two, and header one, I'm saying like um, this website is under construction. Control S and I'm going to call this as a error.html Then save. All right, both the files created now. So now I'm going to upload both of those. If you have a lot of files, yes, you need to upload all that lot of files to this S3 bucket. Click on upload and add files. Go to the folder where you have the data and index.html error.html click on open and upload it all right both files uploaded now now uh, go to go to properties scroll down to bottom edit static website hosting option enable this time i'm going to host a static website and uh, my index.html document is going to be uh, index document is going to be index.html and in case of if i have any errors i'm going to give error.html then scroll down, save changes. When you enable this option, we are going to get an uh, static website endpoint. 
with the help of this url we can access the website we hosted by using this s3 bucket i'm grabbing that url giving that here and it's saying 403 forbidden access denied so the thing is we uploaded but we have not made that object public so it's giving access denied error to make this data public we have two options one is you enable acls for that go to permissions here you can see object ownership bucket owner enforced so that means acl disable so just enable acl i acknowledge save changes so once you enable that acl go to objects select all the data by selecting this option you can select all the data go to actions scroll down make public using acl then click on make public all right now all the data we have inside this s3 bucket made public then go back to this url give a refresh okay then go back and uh, give a refresh it should allow us to access or you can even test uh, the data individually also then go to property go to the url right you can see maybe browser cache played some role right so that's the reason i have uh, taken an incognito window so and you see here this website is delivering now so with the help of this url anyone can access your website uh, across the globe now instead of this acl option if you decided to like you know use another option called bucket policy yes we can do that now before that i'll do one thing i'm going to remove this um, acl settings i have disabled the acls right so now if you decided to use this bucket policy to make any data public now this acl has a problem right for example you added some more data and you have re-uploaded so then again you need to select this and you need to make public instead of doing that what we can do we can simply add a bucket policy so for that go to permissions scroll down bucket policy click on edit and here we have an option called policy generator go to the policy generator and we need this bucket arm grab the bucket arm go here and uh, policy type we are going to apply this policy to our s3 bucket so select s3 bucket policy so effect i'm going to allow the principle means for what user if you want to make it available for only specific iam user you can give that user ar in here but i want to make the data available for everyone and on what what uh, on what bucket that we need to define under this ar in but what actions i don't want to allow all the actions i just want to allow get object option so i'm just giving read permission on my data for everyone this wildcard entry i'm giving so let's give get object permission so then give this bucket arn inside this bucket whatever the data we have we can simply give slash star okay then click on add statement now generate a policy whatever the policy we got it here the simply apply that policy on this bucket then click on save changes now earlier it just a bucket name but after applying the bucket policy if you give a refresh okay so you see here we got a new option it's publicly accessible so the advantage is if you did some modification if you are adding some more data to this s3 bucket you no need to select this object to perform go to actions no need to do this make public using acl so whatever the bucket policy we already applied so that is going to provide permission to everyone to read the data all right so we can use either of the one to make our data public but i personally recommend you to go through this uh, bucket policy option see now we are able to for example somehow you decided to modify this index.html so you have taken down this file then uh, let's delete this file so far this is what the content it delivered but now if you give a refresh you see this 
whatever the content we have inside the error.html that is delivering now. So with this way, we can deliver a custom error messages when our site is under maintenance and all. And also one more thing, if you decided to map any domain name, so you can use uh, Route 53 service. So I already made a video on that. It's available in our YouTube channel playlist. Refer that Route 53 and you can map this S3 bucket. All right. So that's all about uh, S3 static website hosting. And also remember, it's not at all recommended to make our data public. So I'm going to revoke this permissions. But however, if you are going to host a static website, you don't have any other option. You might get a doubt. What is the advantage we are going to get if we host this website uh, with the help of S3? There are a lot of advantages. First thing, you no need, in, no need to maintain any server. In this scenario, we are not maintaining any server to deliver our web page. And defaultly, your website will get s3 uh, like you know performance metrics like uh, per second uh, like you know we can um, uh, per, we can we can, 5500 get requests we can get 3500 put operations we can perform to the website as it is hosted uh, from s3 platform all right so that is all about the s3 static website hosting feature All right, now let's discuss uh, bucket policies in detail. Some time back, we just created permission for everyone and we just uh, hosted our static website, right? Now let's go in detail about this bucket policy. So for that, first navigate to permissions tab in your S3 bucket, scroll down and here you can see the bucket policy. So basically this bucket policy allow us to manage permissions at uh, resource level. We can apply permissions at user level in IAM or group level, right? So, but this bucket policy help us to apply something at uh, resource level, bucket level. Let me take a small scenario now. Let's assume you have two IAM users. Both users have full access on S3, right? S3 service. But for second user, okay. I want to restrict one specific operation on this specific bucket only. Okay, so in that scenario, instead of creating a policy and applying it uh, like, you know, user level or group level, so you can simply create a bucket policy and apply it here. Even through if the operation allowed at user level, when coming to this resource level, it's going to Denny. You remember one thing? When at what level, whether it is a user level, group level, or resource level, at some level, if we deny something, deny is going to take effect. So now, my example is uh, uh, in this uh, video to understand this bucket policy. I'm going to create an IAM user. I'm going to give uh, full access to this user. S3 admin is a user I'm calling. And I'm going to create an IAM user with a custom password just to save some time. And I'm not even enforcing him to create a new password. I'm going to attach S3 full access to this user. Right. So this user has S3 full access. So by default, he's going to get all the access on all S3 bucket. So let me log in. I'm going to take incognito window logging as that newly created user sign in whatever the username and password i have set up i have given and i logged into my aws account and uh, let's navigate to s3 and uh, here you can see this guy is able to view all the s3 buckets Right, so now I want to restrict this user to perform some operation on this specific bucket. So I want to deny delayed operation on this bucket. So currently I have not applied any bucket policy. So he can take the file, he can delete it. And uh, like, you know, he can uh, delete it. So it's successful, why? Because he have S3 full access. I want to restrict this specific operation 
with the help of bucket policy. For that, go to bucket policy, right? So then click on edit and here go with policy generator. So these policies are in JSON format. You no need to write, you can use this uh, policy generator. So then basically it generates a JSON script to apply if you are giving valid options here. I'm going to select S3 bucket policy, allow or deny. So I want to deny delete operation for, a, for that user. So I'm going to select deny. For what user you are going to deny, that user actually comes under principle. Effect means allow operation or deny operation. Principle means for what user you want to. You need to give that user ARN here. So let's go to IAM users. Whenever any user created, we are going to get a user ARN, Amazon resource name. Grab that ARN, give that under principle. If you have multiple, you can give comma and you can give multiple user ARNs also. And what action you want to deny? You see, we have selected effect as a deny, but what do you want to deny? If you want to deny, you can simply select all actions. It's going to give wildcard everything. But my requirement is something different. I don't want to deny everything. I want to deny only delete operation. So scroll down, delete object or delete object version. I'm selecting both, right? Along with that, if you want to add some more, you scroll down and you select that under actions. Okay, so now on what S3 bucket? On what S3 bucket? You should give that S3 bucket ARN here. Now, here there is a small logic. So, you know, we have some bucket level properties and object level properties. For example, I can restrict this user to perform delayed bucket operation. In that scenario, giving bucket ARN is okay. Why? Because so inside the bucket data don't play much role whenever he have delayed uh, bucket permission, right? In that scenario, bucket ARN is okay. But inside that bucket, we may have folders, subfolders and all when coming to delete object option. So we need to define all those. So what you can do, you can give bucket ARN. If you are selecting only bucket level operation, you give bucket ARN. Comma, if you have object level operations, you can give bucket ARN slash star. So you can simply give this bucket ARN as one option and comma bucket ARN slash star inside this bucket. What are the folders, subfolders or whatever data we have inside that also applicable here. Or if you are not sure whether the actions you selected here applicable to bucket or folder or inside the bucket, you simply give both by giving comma. So then AWS is going to pick based on the action automatically. Then you can define that. And even you can even add conditions like, you know, whatever request is coming, if the request is coming from a specific IP address, Right, you can choose if IP address exists, such type of conditions also we can give. Right, then click on add statement. Now, here is the principles, click on generate policy. This policy I'm going to apply on my S3 bucket. Then scroll down, save changes. Now what happened, whenever this guy, S3 admin, trying to delete anything in this S3 bucket, he is going, he should get an error. Now let's select this version.txt file, delete, and whenever he is typing, and you see here, it's failing, it's saying access denied. Now there is one problem. Now let's assume this guy is an intelligent guy. He went to do permissions. He have seen there is a bucket policy applied here. So he can delete this bucket policy? Yes. Why? Because we are restricting him to uh, Denny only upload operation. He is able to read the bucket policy and he is able to delete the bucket policy also. So to not get into that particular loop or issue, right? what we can do, whenever you are generating this bucket policy, okay, you can add one more. I am going to Denny for this user. I am going to Denny for this user to read the bucket policy, get bucket policy. We can even restrict the delayed bucket policy also. Okay, 
So let me choose get bucket policy. All right, he cannot read bucket policy. On what S3 bucket? You give S3 bucket AR now. Go to property from here also you can get. So this is basically bucket level operations last star not really required. Then add statement. Then click on generate policy. Control A, Control C and apply that on your bucket. Now go here, apply that here, scroll down, same changes. Now a bucket policy applied. So we are denying, we are denying, viewing the bucket policy for this S3 admin user on this specific S3 bucket. Now let's go and verify, give a refresh. Now this guy immediately what he's doing is selecting something and he's trying to delete again. And whenever it is giving an error, he went to this permissions. But this time you see, he is not able to modify, he is not able to add. Can he delete? Can he edit? No, we have filled that loophole here uh, in this by, by restricting him to view the bucket policy. So this user is now restricted to delete any object in this bucket. Not only deleting the object, he is not even allowed to view the bucket policy also. Such type of resource level operations we can like you know achieve um, by using uh, bucket policies not only that we even have a lot of examples when you go to this uh, policy examples we can restrict user to perform something on from a specific ip address only right that user must be in that specific ip address to achieve to perform something so you can give that if he is not in this ip address then it is going to delete everything on the specific bucket such type of conditions also you can apply it uh, bucket policy all right so that is one option we have under permissions and also there is an option called acls we can like you know manage permissions uh, of this s3 bucket using acls also for that you can edit so this is uh, your permission everyone if you want to give permission uh, everyone to read data from this bucket you can give that this is acls to read the uh, bucket uh, permissions also you can give this or you want to provide permission to any authenticated user group you can give that or you want to store some logs inside this s3 bucket you can give that as well then scroll down save changes if you want to share this bucket with another account users you can even add grantee you need to give that another user s3 uh, canonical id so when you go to this um, security credentials you can see there is an option called canonical ID that is to share an S3 bucket, right? So you can uh, uh, give that canonical ID of another AWS user and you can share this bucket also. So these all are the options we have uh, on S3 bucket uh, permissions. And uh, the CORS, I made a video on that. So please uh, feel free to refer uh, that CORS video in my YouTube channel. So now let's uh, discuss about uh, another S3 property, right? So that is a uh, object lock option. So whatever the bucket you are working, if you go to properties of that bucket, if you scroll down to almost bottom, you can see an option called object lock. So basically this object lock feature help us to protect our data from deletions or uh, like, you know, uh, for a fixed amount of time. So you have uh, some compliance requirement so that whatever data is uploading to S3 bucket that should not be deleted by anyone for uh, specific uh, uh, days. In that scenario, we can use this object lock feature. So one thing, this object lock feature, we can enable only whenever uh, we are creating a bucket. After creating a bucket, there is no direct option to edit and enable this feature. If you want, you can contact AWS uh, customer support. So then to their help, then they will help you to enable this object lock feature. So instead of that process, I'll create a new bucket and I'll enable this object lock feature and let's discuss how exactly like, you know, we can configure this uh, object uh, lock to protect our data. I'm going to call this as a, uh, 
uh, very I'm giving simple name avinas.lock.test hope nobody taken that bucket name and I'm going with Mumbai region block all public access and one important thing if you want to use this object lock feature versioning must be enabled even though if you not enable versioning here if you scroll down and expanding this advanced settings if you are selecting object lock option enable here and you see versioning is going to enable automatically so without versioning we cannot enable this feature right so you need to give like a little acknowledgement then click on create bucket now a bucket created and in this bucket object lock is enabled now we just enable the feature we haven't configured anything before configuration before setting up the retention so if you upload something uh, let me upload something here and upload it and i want to delete this object so again versioning is enabled so i want to delete it permanently so again if you go here if you delete what happened this object is going to delete delete marker will create if you delete the delete marker we will get object back but what i want to do is i want to delete this permanently so or i want to make this bucket empty right so then i'm like you know we can bucket empty we can go to bucket properties and do that now i set version to show now i'm trying to delete this and we need to type permanently delete as you are aware if you are typing permanently delete that object is going to delete completely and it's success you might get a doubt okay we enable object lock and the object uh, we are able to delete successfully see enabling that feature is not sufficient you need to configure the retention period so go and click on edit this object lock enable the retention period we have two types of retention periods one is governance mode and second one is compliance mode if you are choosing governance mode a specific iam user like you know whoever have valid permissions on this s3 platform and all they can disable this feature they can change the like you know uh, they can they can like uh, override or they can delete the protected uh, object versions right so but if you are setting this compliance mode no user can override no one can delete okay so to delete object that have this configuration you must close the aws account that they are associated with all right then only it will now uh, during the compliance period we cannot delete it that's an important thing for how many days we can give one day or one year also you can give this for testing purpose i'm giving one day now what happened after one day if i upload something now after one day then i can delete it then i can uh, like you know delete the object then i can delete the bucket now save changes i have set up uh, compliance mode now whatever the object i'm going to upload to this bucket i cannot delete during the retention period so first one day is a retention period i cannot delete during that time so i'm going to upload same object again click on upload now let's try to empty this bucket first i'm selecting my bucket click on empty and whenever you are trying to empty this bucket you need to type permanently delete let's copy that permanently delete and it's giving an error saying access denied also let's go inside the bucket i want to delete it permanently so i'm going to set show versions select this object delete type permanently delete whenever you are deleting this object again it is giving an error what if you set version to hide and if you delete yes it will delete but the important point is delete marker is going to override we can delete the delete marker and get the object back so the object is overridden with the delete marker it's not deleting permanently so if you select this object so now object lock is enabled with compliance mode and retention period is one day so for till tomorrow i cannot delete this object once that one day retention period completes yes i can delete then only i can even delete this bucket also now even though if you go to properties now you change this retention period to disable can we delete this object now no you have only two options either wait till that day pass otherwise you close your aws account okay i have disable the retention period now i'm trying to permanently delete it you see 
it won't allow you. So that is what this uh, object lock feature is. Right, along with this object lock feature, we do have some more uh, S3 bucket properties. Right, remaining all are very small features on this S3 bucket. I'll take some time to explain that. So encryption, I'm going to make a dedicated video on that. So I'll uh, just uh, share you. Server access logging. If you want to enable logging on this specific S3 bucket, you can use the server access logging. Edit, all you need to do is just enable. Where do you want to store all these S3 bucket logs? So better to choose a different bucket. The reason if you are choosing same bucket, unnecessarily lot of logs are going to generate. So to not get like, you know, that, that unnecessary pricing also will occur, right? So instead of selecting same bucket, you choose any other bucket. So then you like, you know, you, you choose the path. So then scroll down, save changes. So, right. I have selected source and target bucket as the same. And you can see this a little uh, information window. Additional logs are going to create it. So that like, you know, that additional logs make us difficulty to find the actual thing and also billing also okay so instead of that you can like uh, choose a different bucket if you want to enable logging for multiple resources you can always depend on cloud trail you can go here you can configure uh, cloud trail basically cloud trail is a logging service it logs everything in our aws environment let's go and create a trail what trails you want to what is the trail name you want to give in what bucket you want to store all these logs you want to create a new bucket you can give that and um, not enabling uh, encryption now if you observe there is an option called data events you can go and you can select data events as a s3 okay so whenever you are giving this uh, uh, s3 as a data event you see here you want to log everything. You want to log read-only event, write-only events, or custom, you can give selector name also. I'm going to give all events. And also this selector name, whenever you're going with a custom, you can define that. Then click on next. Now what happened? All S3 data level operations, put operations, get operations, everything are going to stored in this selected S3 bucket, whatever the bucket we are creating now. Right, so that is for all buckets, but this feature like uh, enable logging for only one specific S3 bucket that is a server access logging and uh, transfer acceleration. So we have AWS global infrastructure, right? Within that, primarily we have three components one is uh, regions, so it's a geographical location or physical location, availability zones within the regions, we have data centers right or combination of multiple data centers we call that as the availability zone every region contains a minimum of two to three data centers or availability zones right so then we have edge locations edge location mechanism is it's designed to like a case the content near to end customer geographical location so the advantage we are going to deliver content with low latency to the end customer so for that, we can use this uh, transfer acceleration. Whatever data you're going to upload to this S3 bucket or download from the S3 bucket, generally it happened like, you know, based on this bucket location. For example, we created this bucket in Mumbai region. So now what happened when I'm trying to upload something, the data flow over the internet to this Mumbai region data center and it stores. And even while accessing also same. So when geographical distance is less, it's okay. But if you have so, a bucket somewhere else in Northern Virginia and all, for example, I have a bucket here somewhere else in Northern Virginia. And uh, this bucket now, like uh, it's in Northern Virginia, if I'm trying to access something, so definitely it's going to take some time. Why? Because I'm sitting somewhere else in India. This bucket is in Northern Virginia. To reduce that uh, data uploads or uh, like, you know, data transfer, we can use this transfer acceleration feature. Again, there is one limitation on this feature. If you want to use this transfer acceleration, you should not have dot in the bucket name. You click on edit. All you need to do is just enable then click on save changes. But again, you might get a doubt. Okay, if I directly upload something to this S3 bucket, how much speed I'm going to get. If I enable this feature, 
how much like you know better performance we are going to get if you want to test yes you can go to this learn more option here and there is a transfer acceleration speed comparison tool you observe this left pane you can see speed comparison tool go to the speed comparison tool select the url and all you need to do is you just need to replace the region and the bucket name now my bucket name is avinash and this is in northern virginia region the region code is us east one so now let's take this file and the region code is us east one then my bucket name is avidosh now let's enter this within the browser so then automatically aws will try to upload a sample file directly okay to a northern virginia s3 bucket without using any uh, edge locations mechanism so that that result without using any edge location the below one s3 accelerated transfer upload speed by using this cloud front right or so by using edge location how quickly we can upload the data the difference between this direct upload and its transfer acceleration enable one it will show you the difference if you are getting good positive results then you can enable this option and uh, you can like you know uh, improve your data transfer to this s3 bucket but if you are not getting good like you know it, it's just 35 38 percentage so then you can like you know take a call of this whether you are need to enable this or not but if you wait for some time it is going to perform tests for different different locations if you are getting good positive results like 100 percent 200 percent sometimes you get 400 percent also right again this varies based on the location where you are this depends on the internet bandwidth you are using right so you can test it so if you really want you can go and enable this and you can use this endpoint to upload or download all the data so that is a transfer acceleration feature let me wait till this test also completes let's see how much uh, 54 percentage right so same way if you wait for some more time it is going to perform testing for all these regions right so that is a transfer acceleration feature along with the transfer acceleration feature we have uh, some more properties like uh, requester pace when coming to this requester pace instead of the bucket owner whoever is accessing data from this s3 bucket that guy need to pay for this uh, data transfers or uh, api calls he's performing on my s3 bucket for example i i have an object and i share that object with everyone and everybody is accessing that object n number of the times per day and they're downloading it right and so you know aws uh, cost us based on how much storage uh, like you know you have in your s3 bucket or the entire platform and then how many operations happening put operations get operations for that get operation also we are going to get charged and how much data transfer is happening so when coming to this bucket when i am sharing any object for request i need to pay for data transfer i need to pay if i don't want to pay what i can do i can go and enable this edit this and enable this request or pay is right so then anonymous access to this s3 bucket is going to be disabled right so the requester need to pay for the request as well as data transfer happening from this bucket so that is a requester pays option all right so then uh, another option is intelligent tiring archive configuration so whenever you are not sure about your data access pattern you can use this intelligent tiring archive configuration create configuration you can give a name you want to apply to all the data you want to keep it in enable state now so then you can configure so generally if you are not sure about your data access pattern then you can use this intelligent tire archive configuration option right so if you like you know want to move 
whatever data you have in intelligent archive tier if you are not accessing that from last 90 days or more so you can move to archive access tier so that like you know saves you some more cost for example whatever the data i have not accessed in last 100 days those all files automatically move to this intelligent tier archive access tier so comparatively that we are going to get like you know 10 percent lower storage cost for the data we are storing here again just like glacier you need to initiate the restoration right so that is a uh, intelligent tire uh, uh, archive configuration we have an s3 bucket all right uh, one more small option under management we have an option called inventory configuration you can create an inventory of this s3 bucket generally inventory is going to give all information about this resource right you create an inventory and uh, do you want to include any specific prefix only specific prefix um, for this inventory or only current versions or all versions where do you want to store this inventory report i want to store this inventory report in the one of the bucket the destination bucket whatever the bucket i'm going to select that bucket is going to enable this with um, json uh, bucket policy and how frequently you want to generate that inventory report daily weekly and what kind of format you're expecting right csv apache parquet or c csv is easy just like an excel sheet and you want to keep it in enable state or disable state you want to enable the report that is generating you want to add any additional metadata field along with that uh, the regular one so then you can create automatically like you know a generate a inventory report will generate and it is going to store here but first report is going to take 48 hours to generate right and uh, yeah that is inventory report configuration along with that we have storage class uh, analysis option also how exactly we are going to get a report uh, on inventory similar way what are the data we have in this s3 bucket what storage class is already applied what is the data access pattern and uh, what exactly uh, the, the the more suitable storage class for the data so you know for all those all you can do is we can create an anal uh, storage class analysis report so you can give a valid name apply to all data apply to all objects in this bucket and you want to get the report then you can create configuration again after 48 hours you are going to get a report in csp format file that report will tell you how much data you have how many times you are accessing the data what is the appropriate uh, storage class you can add to the data such type of all report we are going to get and the advantage is by looking at that report you can choose uh, appropriate storage class for your data so that is a helpful option to choose appropriate storage class for our uh, uh, entire data we have in s3 bucket all right so that is all about um, uh, storage class uh, analysis as well as inventory and some other s3 properties all right let's talk about uh, s3 monitoring whatever the resource we are going to create and we are going to work so obviously we at some point of time we just want to like you know monitor those resources like uh, how much uh, uh, size of the resource how many objects we have right so if you want to monitor entire s3 platform there is an option called account snapshot okay so for this there is a service called storage lens so with the help of storage lens aws is going to analyze all our resources and it is going to give the snapshot so by default it is going to like you know enable so you no need to do any additional things to get this right you can see currently my uh, object count is 532 and total storage is uh, 120 uh, mb this is the average object size so you can click on this view storage lens dashboard it will take you to the storage lens and you can see right uh, what is the total storage object count how many active buckets how many accounts i have everything it is going to show here so this is one thing for entire uh, account level overview one 
But if you want to track uh, bucket level ones, for example, this bucket I have created on uh, June 21st. If you want to like, you know, verify uh, metrics, like uh, how much, how many objects we have inside this bucket on a specific day. Currently, I can say I have five objects, but yesterday it might be different day up before yesterday. It might be different, right? And even size of this uh, bucket also, we can further navigate to manage uh, metrics. And here you can see total two uh, metrics we have. So you can filter one day, one week, two weeks metrics. You can even adjust the timeline here. And uh, you observe here when I selected two weeks. So from this time onwards, it's going to be like uh, this bucket size I have and how much data we have in Glacier, how much we have uh, uh, in um, standard storage and total number of objects, how many objects we have here. It is showing all this. But these two graphs basically comes under uh, free or default uh, metrics we are going to get with the help of CloudWatch. So CloudWatch is a service. It helps us to monitor any resource in AWS. Okay. Now, if you want more metrics, so then scroll down, click on view additional metrics, additional charts. So then go to this request metrics. Uh, as I mentioned, these two, it's free. No need to pay anything. But whatever the metrics you are going to enable now, you need to, you are going to get charged very minimal charge. So for that, Click on manage filters and create a filter. So then give a name. My S3 monitor is the name I'm giving. So what is the scope? You want to limit the scope to only uh, specific uh, prefixes. Then you can give the prefix or only tagged objects or a specific access S3 access point. You can give that. I'm going to filter apply to all objects in this specific bucket Then create filter. So now one filter created whenever you go here to the request metrics and uh, whatever the filter you created select the filter now then it is going to show you all the available metrics that we can get but remember these all are paid so how many http requests are coming how many get requests how many put requests delayed operations happened head request port request right so how much data scanned how much data returned how much data downloaded HTTP status codes like how many 400 errors occurred, 500 errors occurred, and what is the latency? Such type of all we are going to get in similar manner. Okay, so that is a monitoring option, and also uh, we can integrate this uh, cloud. Uh, sorry, we can integrate this S3 platform with some of the third party applications okay so um, aws also supports some third party applications so when coming to specific to this s3 s3 we can access if you're if you're using windows operating system you can try out a lot of applications like we have s3 browser so just search for s3 browser download you can see there is a tool called s3 browser you can try this tool it's basically it supports only windows operating system at moment you go and download this install this and you can access all your s3 resources by using this third party application and we have another tool called uh, cyberduck you can try this cyberduck also right you can just download and you install this and you can use this cyberduck also, we have some like, you know, tools like a uh, Cloudberry Explorer. Just search for Cloudberry Explorer for S3. And this is the official website, ms msp360.com. Go here and just download what exactly like, you know, uh, tool you want to like you just download this tool and you install. So we are good with a free one. So once you download and install this tool in your local laptop, you need to configure uh, access key ID and secret access key. So for that, navigate to IAM. So in my laptop, I have this, I have installed this Cloudberry Explorer. Okay, so whatever this third party tools, basically it asks for access key ID and secret access key to access these resources, whatever the user you are creating. So uh, I'm calling it as a third party access 
test. I don't require any management console access. Click on next and always follow least privileges mechanism. Better to give only uh, permissions really required. So I'm going to give ST read only access. Select ST read only access. Then click on create user. All right, now I want to use this user to configure with third party application. So go to security credentials and you can see access keys. Click on create access key, select command line interface. Scroll down, I understand, click on next and create access key. So now you see we got an access key ID and secret access key. This access key ID and secret access key, you can configure in the third party application uh, you want to access this S3 platform. As I told you, I already have this uh, Cloudberry Explorer. I'm opening the Cloudberry Explorer tool now. And all you need to do is just under connection, give this plus symbol, click on Amazon S3. And you give a account name. Um, I'm going to call this as a YT demo S3. And this is asking for access key ID grab the access key ID and give that here. Then asking for secret access key, give that here, then test connection. Okay, connection success. So the configured user is able to access S3. Right, click on okay. Now go and give a double click here. It is going to show all the S3 buckets you have in your uh, AWS account. If you want to perform, if you want to copy something, if you want to do something, you just go inside that bucket whatever the files you have here, you can go here, like, you know, you can go to the desktop, for example, I want to copy something uh, to this uh, YT folder, I want to copy this version.txt, so I can simply, like, um, right, we have uh, options here, you can move, or you can, like, you know, you can move, click on that, so you want to move this, when you click on yes and you see here version.txt is now copied here and same way whatever file you have here you can even send it to s3 platform and basically this um, mac uh, one the freeware it have very limited options but if you are trying with windows you have a lot of options so go to any bucket and just give right click on that bucket you can see a lot of options available here and also we can initiate multi-part upload also here. What is the size? What is the chunk size? What is the maximum threads you want to give? Right, so such type of uh, configurations also we can do with this uh, explorer. And also you can even try out um, this uh, tool, uh, all pro versions for 15 days. So I'll recommend you give a try. Okay, so that is, um, uh, integrating our uh, S3 platform with uh, third-party applications we have. And also, if you are looking for any data transfers to this S3 platform from on-premise to AWS, we have some services like uh, AWS uh, Snow Family. You can depend on this uh, Snow Family and you can order a Snow device where AWS is uh, going to send an empty device to us so that you connect to your local network, you copy all the data and send that uh, data device to AWS. AWS will copy the selected, uh, all the data to the selected S3 bucket or vice versa. You already have data in S3 platform. You want to get the data to your local. So then you order a device and you need to select like uh, whether it is an import job or export job or you just want to use it in your local environment. So in this case, AWS sends an empty one, you use it for your purpose and you send that empty device back after uh, erasing everything. So import into S3, click on next, like uh, here, uh, how much storage you required. So these are storage capacities, 14 TB, 1 TB, right? Uh, so it's a uh, 80 TB uh, SDD and 1 TB SSD, right? So based on your requirement, you can select that. So you need to have that uh, USB-C power supply cable and the pricing options and in next steps you need to choose uh, uh, to uh, which address it need to ship and all. So we can use this uh, basically Snow Family devices to transfer uh, all the data to S3 platform or from S3 platform to our uh, on-premise. So for data migration we can use this device.
And also we have one service that we can integrate with this S3 platform that is a storage gateway. AWS storage gateway basically this is a hybrid uh, storage integration service. So basically the storage gateway is a VM that deploys an on-premise environment and uh, it, uh, it uh, case the data. Right. It on-premise access to virtually unlimited cloud storages. So you first need to create a gateway. You need to uh, like uh, activate that gateway. So for what purpose you are going to use this? So basically this Amazon S3 file gateway. So it can store and access objects in S3 by using network file system or server message block uh, data with local caching. All data is going to cache in that, like you know, in uh, in uh, this gateway, right? So you can use the storage gateway for hybrid uh, caching mechanisms. For that, you need to choose a gateway type as file gateway. So the data is going to cache here, and also we have another option like you know, store and access iSCSI block storage volumes in Amazon S3. You store all the data in S3, and you can access that. And tape gateway, again, if you're using any uh, virtual tape libraries or any third party applications uh, that takes backup and you want to store that backups in uh, S3 platform, then you can choose this uh, tape gateway option and uh, you can. So all you need to do is what is your existing on premise uh, uh, environment type is you need to choose that, right? So if you're using VMware, you need to download. Uh, OVF template and you need to deploy that and you need to activate that. So once you connect to AWS, then you can um, review and activate and then you can configure gateway, what data need to cache and uh, right how the caching need to work. So those all things we can configure here. So there is a like, you know, chance to get one question in a certification exam on this uh, storage gateway, right? So yeah, so this is a hybrid solution. So we can store uh, data in S3 or on-premise or this device will cache most frequently access data. So that is all about uh, uh, S3 service we have uh, in AWS. All right, thanks for watching this video guys. Um, see you again with new video.